All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from beautiful Blue Sky, San Diego. And today I'm joined from Boston, Massachusetts, Daniel Clickman. How are you doing, Daniel? Good. Thanks, John. And thanks to everybody with Wizard here. Um, good to see yeah. you all. Absolutely. And Daniel is a CMO of Wave.video and the B2, B2U podcast. In the influencer of influencers. I like it. Um, so what we're going to actually talk about today is how you can actually be a build marketing and um, use video to build marketing and your sales funnel with video. So I um, mean, uh, one of the things that's interesting, Daniel, is obviously through what we've been through with the pandemic now, it seems like everybody is Everybody's into video these days, uh, but um, not everybody really knows how to use it effectively. Right, and I think I think this is it predates the the pandemic. I think the pandemic sure. just highlights everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, really, 2019 was the year where everybody was getting onto video, and we've seen some brands do extremely well switching. Essentially, what seem appears to be switching all the social media content from uh, images to video mm -hmm. and and a lot of companies have jumped on that in 2019 to say hey, let's just do videos and it works better but it turns yeah. out you have to have a strategy so 2020 is the the rethinking is the year when everybody's like okay so what is the actual strategy for video uh what, where how do we get it to actually work and it's sort of a collective shift and, and we're seeing something emerge the same way that content marketing kind of emerged as a discipline now video marketing is emerging in front of our eyes um, and uh, yeah, it's a very interesting times. So what do you? So let's uh, um, just baseline it a little bit. What you mean by video marketing? Because I think a lot of people think video marketing is just attaching a video to an email. Yeah, I think the, you know video marketing is is a would be the best way to describe it is simply the usage of video uh, to build funnels or to to drive traffic, sales, and, and different stages of your funnels. Through the uses of video, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Video in an email is maybe what salespeople like to do, or it's one step or one possibility. But there's video on social media, there's video in groups, there's video on your website, there's video on landing pages. There are many different kinds of videos that you can that you can create and post and and share in different ways, right? Different formats. So uh, if you think video first. You're mm -hmm. a video marketer, right? Um, right? And if you're just thinking, oh, I need to send out an email, but maybe if I add a video to that email, it'll perform better. You're not a video marketer. You're an email marketer that is now adding more work right. to your workload. Right? Yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's pretty much the difference. And, and, a, and a video marketer, somebody says, okay, I, can do, I, can, I know how to engage with video. How do I get my video out in front of people? Oh, email is a great option as well. Let's do it through email. Mm. Yeah, so it's all. I mean, as you say, it's all. It's all about the the strategy behind it. So, before so before a company like launches itself fully into using video or doing video marketing, what's a couple of the considerations that they should take into account? Ah, I mean, it's a, an interesting and very uh, general question. Um, one, I guess, is the overall strategy of you know how do you become video first. Right, so there's some activities you don't want to replace. For instance, SEO activities still work; it yes. still drives a lot of traffic, right? Uh, but say email marketing or blog creation, right? If you just yep. think the same way and add video into your blog, all you're doing is you're getting marginal improvements on top of um, additional work. Mm -hmm. So creating video is expensive in terms of effort and yep. maybe money. Sometimes it's sometimes it can be a lot of money. So you have to think, okay, how do I dramatically change my workflow so video doesn't become more work but becomes actually less work uh, and I get my ROI. So an example for that would be um, I could create a blog post and then add a video, right? It's now I still have the same workflow and add a video. Or I could think video first. What's a great video content I can create? I can get a guest together, um, record like we're doing right now, an interesting mm -hmm. conversation. And then how do I post that to the blog. We need text on the blog. So maybe we transcribe it. Maybe we uh, outsource it to somebody who, who writes a summary. That takes a lot less work than thinking of a concept mm -hmm. and a whole new blog topic, right? Um, so I can do that. I can just take that video and transcribe it. 
create um, create do the SEO optimization to that and post that. Tag the same person I interviewed, so now I'm getting more, more, um, even more reach and more virality to it. Right. So I've replaced the workflow, I've replaced the whole concept because in video first, I can create something with less work rather than more work. Right? Does it replace other activities? Sometimes, but oftentimes it's in addition to. It's just another way yeah. of doing things. Right? And I think that's a. I mean, that's the essence, really, of of um, you know being smart with any uh, you know any content marketing strategy is that idea of you do one thing, but you can leverage it in multiple ways. As you said, you can do a video, you can have a blog post out of it. Maybe you chop up the video for smaller pieces or or whatever. Um, but um, but yeah, that idea of of creating an asset that then you can use in in multiple different ways. Um, so how much does uh, how much does production values how much do production values matter uh, in terms of if you had to say which is more important the strength of the content or the strength of the production values uh, uh, the content absolutely mm -hmm. so the and it, it also depends on the where the video is so video on your sure. homepage the production value is very very important mm -hmm. because that's the the expectation of the viewer is that. The video on the homepage is your is your is your window is your the, the display of the best you, right? Uh, that's where you're gonna people expect you to put a lot of effort into it, and they will judge you by that, right? Uh, so if you see a Kakamami video on somebody's homepage, you think, oh, maybe it's like a, a shady startup or something. If you see a right, highly right. produced video, say, oh, that's a expensive company or very mm -hmm. established, right? So you kind of have to think what's the appropriate uh, amount you want to spend on that. The other, uh, if you're going on a live, say on a, um, on Instagram, while you're at an event, people will tolerate mm -hmm. very uh, poor quality of video. The content is what's really interesting there, mm -hmm. right? Oh, I, I, there's something that's happening right now. That's why I'm going live right here in a very shaky environment, literally, right? And um, and that's what's interesting. That's why I'm bringing it to you because it's relevant right now. And when that's a situation, the quality of production is really not important. It's it's, mm -hmm. a it's and the value is driven, and the relationship is driven by the fact that I'm bringing something uh, of news quality to them. That's where yeah. the, that and it builds relationships, right? So that's really really important. So again, depends on the channel, but co the content will always trump quality, uh, regardless of which uh, which uh, where you're at. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then, what is um and and obviously you're you're very close to this. So, what is what is the relative engagement rate that you get from video that's you know done well and strategically placed as opposed to maybe other types of assets? Oh wow, uh, I mean, it really depends on the in the channel. So, in email, for instance, open ratios, um, uh, click through ratios can double or triple if you put a mm -hmm. video in there, right? Open ratios uh, will op will increase if you have say. Um, um, brackets video in the in the subject line because maybe it's a novelty, maybe it's people really want the video in the email. Who knows, right? But that will open create uh, change the open ratios, and um, so the click through ratios will be high. We know that in social medias, the reach is something like three to six hundred percent higher for mm -hmm. video than for um, image or text. Now, bear in mind this could also be as simple as you take an image. Uh, animate some text on top of it. So what would have been static is simply in video format now, right? It doesn't have to be a, a high production actors or that. It could be something as simple as that, um, and it could be a 10 second video, right? So even that will deliver a lot more, um, a, a lot more reach than mm -hmm. an image a video. Now here's an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, um, anecdote. People always when promoting blog posts, right? People always tell me, yeah, but when you promote with a video, you can't, if you click on the video, it doesn't take you to the blog post. Yeah. Will you, will you put the, um, the link in the text, in the description, right? In the post itself. And you can put a little emoji with a pointer or something like that sure. to make it a little stand out a bit. But you put the link up there and in the video, you, you, can, you can say at the end of the video, hey, click the link to learn more or something like that. And that brings about two to three times more clicks than if you just had a, a link uh, post. So it's. I think a lot of us were educated to, to in a certain format for a certain 
era where if video wasn't the uh, the dominant mm. fact, um, medium, and we're adjusting to realize, oh wait, the things we thought were are now wrong. Reality has changed. So um, so yeah, across the board today, I, mean, I think we pretty much all know this. Video delivers more uh, results than pretty much any other uh, format. Not to say that you should never have any other format. A mix is healthy. It's good for various reasons. And, um, and video is not killing everything else. It's just taking over a bunch. Yeah. And I think the other thing that people sometimes overlook is how much YouTube, for instance, is used as a search engine. Uh, and I think that's a thing that a lot of people don't realize that. And, they, and how much it's used by business people in B2B business to search for for things that they're interested in or things that maybe can help their business. So that if you don't have, if you're not there and if you haven't got your video there and you haven't optimized it, you're missing out on a huge search channel. Huge search channel. Now this, this brings a great point. So in whether you host on YouTube or whether you host and say wave that video, um, you, if you add a video, embed it on your page and a website and a blog post, wherever, right? If you adjust your code correctly, you have to put, you have to have a video site map. You have to have the, the schema arranged around the video. So you have to have a developer to do this, no matter who you host with. Um, and if you have that, your video could show up in search results. And when people click the thumbnail of that video, it'll go to your page or blog post, which is huge because this is like the second or third, depending on Google, the second or third line in the search results could mm -hmm. be just videos. In many cases, especially B2B, you will find very few, if any, competitors who have this video show up in search results. So you have this like beautiful thumbnail with a video, right? And, and it's right up there in the top with very little competition. And that can drive far more traffic than being you know, one, a link above or below that. Yeah. So this is a huge, huge factor for SEO today. Specifically in B2B, the opportunities are huge. Right? Now again, you have to do a little bit of, of magic around it, um, but, and then you have to have a video. Right? Now the video doesn't have to be, you don't have to film actors, you don't have to have a talking mm -hmm. head. You can just take the text of the blog post, uh, you can go to wave.video editor, edit some of that, uh, uh, you know, put a background image, take some of the copy paste that text and put it in as bullet points or something. And that's it. It could be a short video. And that video will show up as your search results. So it's it's a wonderful technique for SEO as well. Yeah, no, that's a, that, that, those are great points. And it's, as you said, I think uh, a lot of people haven't caught on to that yet, uh, for sure. And it's been around for quite a while, for a few years, but it's taken a lot of, you know what, it's it's simply difficult to do. Uh, right. It takes some development, but once you get it done, it's automatic now for every video you embed on your website. So uh, it's it's surprising that it's it it hasn't been kind of added automatically to the WordPress themes and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm, just, sure. One of those yeah. situations, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so where do you see, um, looking, putting on your, your future hat, where do you see video going from here? Oh, uh, interesting. Uh, well, I think one thing we've been seeing in the with the Corona situ uh, pandemic situation, this lockdown, is that uh, informality has become now appropriate, also in B two B and in enterprise, mm -hmm. and in places in in places that you wouldn't have imagined it before. So I was watching, say, I think it was uh, Bloomberg or, or New York Times. I was watching, um, um, I think it was Bloomberg TV, and a reporter had to work from home. So they were mm -hmm. showing, they were filming from home and it started out with them in their bedroom with, you know, their clothes and the laundry around them. Mm -hmm. And they kind of played with that. And then they went and then they moved to the kitchen and they had a two camera set up so you could see them talking to another person in Zoom that they were interviewing for the show. And I thought that's a remarkable change because half a year ago, yeah. anything but an anchor at the proper desk with the proper lighting and oh, a ton of makeup would have been completely unthinkable, right? And now when you're talking to a salesperson somewhere, you know, they're not wearing a suit and tie in the office. They're at home and they're saying, oh, you know, my kids are out there. I need to get back to my kids. And it's completely fine. And you identify with it. In fact, we like it because yeah. now we're not seeing an abstract brand. We're seeing uh, real human beings working uh, that together create um, an entity, right? And we <laughs> connect to that. And so this human is the human humanizing of the brand, this informality, 
uh, show, you know, bringing out these this this quirkiness and the character of the people, I think, is something that we it's starting to happen, and yet we haven't uh, systemized it, we haven't strategized around it, we don't really understand as marketers how do we mm-hmm. capitalize on that? How do we turn that into something that's really uh, really cool and great that people love. And I, my guess is we'll see a couple of brands figure that out within the next several months. And everybody's going to say, oh, wow, those guys are amazing. Look what they did. And look how much, you know, look at the, and it'll, we'll see like this one case study that everybody's going to refer to, you know, the, the, uh, um, it's like that uh, the Dollar Shaving Club that was for years, oh. the, the one example that everybody mm-hmm. can talk about on video, right? Um, and this will be, and this, the, the, we'll see like a couple of those examples happening and, everybody, and everybody's going to want to do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great point because I think there's a certain authenticity and I think people have craved that because I think here's the thing about technology in many ways is technology has over a period of time dehumanized the experience in many ways and it's it's almost put up barriers or allowed people to hide behind you know different layers of technology and taking the human element out of it now when you get a situation like this and you start to re-engage and you re- as you say i mean you may be on a, a zoom meeting i've had cats that come on to ones i've done i've had dogs i've been introduced to people's yeah. children and it's all great and it's all great and it's all very humanizing and it's now almost it's this is the first time i think we're really seeing technology bringing an ad- added level of human connection as opposed to subtracting it. Right, exactly. And now, so the question, I guess, that we some some small marketers out there are asking mm-hmm. with the budget are asking themselves right now is, how do I play with this to make it my weapon, like to be mm-hmm. the, the most authentic, the most humanized brand, the, the one that gets shared a lot and talked about a lot, right? How do I maybe... Uh, create a little bit of theater here and really play on it. Not not to create something fake, but mm-hmm. to bring out a bit of drama and, and actually bring out more of these personalities and more of these situations uh, where, uh, when possible. It, it's something we're not used to doing, but I'm sure we'll see some actually getting it right. Uh, and yeah. that would be cool. And I'm, no, I'm sure we will. And I'm sure we'll see a lot of people getting it wrong too, because there will <laughs> see a lot of people trying to, as you say, trying to create authenticity or, you know, deliberately bringing yeah. animals into the equation. Because you can't, this is the, the great stuff about this is you can't fake it. It's obvious when it's, when it happens naturally right. and it's obvious when it's staged. So, uh, I mean, I think that's the great thing about it, but yeah, you're going to get people who understand yeah. how to, how to, how to, accentuate that humanness and 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 an interesting uh and a very interesting sort of phenomenon that maybe ties into this a bit is that uh, in the last maybe decade or even less uh firms have become a lot more distributed right we yes. all have some levels of outsourced components to our operations and so whether we're cognizant of it or not we have somebody in india working on something and we have somebody in in ukraine working on something and somebody in the philippines and somebody in south america and somebody in europe and they're all part of our global sort of family Mm -hmm. if you will and maybe they're working part-time for us and part-time for somebody else but they're still part of our organization and i think it's always been uh kind of um a dirty little secret, you know. We didn't want people to know. Oh, we're outsourcing to somebody out there, out yeah. there because they're cheaper or because you know mm-hmm. whatever. But you know what? It's now become so pervasive that it's 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 everybody's pretending like it's not happening, but it is. This is the reality, right? We're all doing it, and and I think now we're all a little more exposed to it working remote because we're all a little bit that, right? Yeah. So. Um, so I think the question of how do we bring this more multicultural, this more internationalization into this mix and not hide it, but actually bring it out there is another interesting question. You know, I'm, I work for an international group of people. We have three offices, in one in Boston, one in St. Petersburg, Russia, one in Lviv, Ukraine. These are official offices. And then we have sort of satellite people around those offices that work mm-hmm. with remote uh, from Australia to San Diego. So it's... Um, you know, and and I'm proud. I always I've always said, you know, I, I don't want to hide the fact that we're an international group of people. It's strength. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's who we are. Yeah, uh, we bring more to the table. 
and you know, and and, and sometimes people look at me and say, you know, that's really brave that you're doing. And I'm like, no, that's yeah. <laughs> you know, people should know who they're dealing with. Yeah. You know, otherwise yeah. they will one day get answered by Olga, and they'll say like, wait, where are you from, Olga? I thought you know, like, yeah. no, you should be happy for it. So, um, you know, so I think this is an interesting trend that we might see happen is that we'll see more voices and more accents and more um, visibility. And, you know, how the call centers used to be from, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the name, the have fake names like John yeah. or Mary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, and it was Aljun. And, you know, so why change your name? You know, hey, Aljun, yeah. nice, to meet, nice to meet you. Yeah, and yeah. that's it, right? So. No, I, I 100% agree. And to be honest, I mean, I think it's, um, I think we're going to start to cross over now because we've run a largely virtual organization for about six or seven years and we made a strategic decision to do it a a long time Mm -hmm. ago for a lot of different reasons and not least of all was access to talent and uh and and expertise and and especially nowadays in the business like there's so many specialized things that need to be done and sometimes you have specialized tasks that you don't need somebody full-time for Right. But you need them done every so often. So it makes sense to outsource that to somebody uh, who's an expert in that rather than try and have somebody internally become kind of OK at it when well, they're really good at something else. But they can kind of be OK at this thing that you need done. It makes more sense. And therefore, I think we're going to see um, that people suddenly realize that this is a smarter way to work. And in fact, the traditional one of having your office and having everybody pretty much live in this certain like mile radius of the office and come in is going to look very archaic very soon yeah i agreed but the, but uh, but i think when it comes down to video it's going to be increasingly increasingly difficult to hide that fact yes. right mm-hmm. and so either you stay behind the curve and, and and be you know and pretend like that's not happening but that limits how many people you have that can be customer facing etc um and maybe that demoralizes some people in your company and so on and so forth. Or you embrace it and say, you know yeah. what, we're a global community. This yeah. is who we are. And, um, and, and, and make that a strength somehow. And yeah, that's absolutely. the, and I think that's, and I think, and I think we are def, and, and definitely in the industry I work with and I go to conference and I talk, I have a bit of an accent, if you haven't noticed, mm-hmm. right? I grew yeah, up in I Israel. Yeah, I got a bit of one as well. Okay. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm Irish, so there you go. Irish. And so, you know, 20 years ago, uh, when I first moved to to Boston, I was very cognizant of my accent and people were very welcoming, but they always kind of asked me like, where are you from? Or what, you know, what's, uh, you know, what's your story? And there would be, mm-hmm. you know, and I, and I was very self-aware of it because there weren't many people like me in their world. Mm-hmm. Now they're very used to it. And when I go to conferences or when I go to sales meetings or what have you, um, it's just, they're just completely used to that. No, and they're talking to people from all over the world every day. My accent seems very, very mild compared yeah. to other accents they've met. So, um, I think that's that's really not a problem anymore. And that becomes, and it actually, in some cases, it's actually enriches, and people are kind of interested. Oh, this is a, a bit different. It's kind of nice. It's kind of cool. Right? Yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, I've always been a bit fortunate because you know, when you come to America with an Irish accent, you know, half the you know, three quarters of the country claims <laughs> Irish descent. So I'm, I'm good. <laughs> well, well listen daniel this has been fantastic um all of daniel's information being his contributor bio below this but before we go daniel please tell everybody a little bit more about um wave video oh fantastic thank you so wave.video uh is and that's the url of the company as well wave.video uh, is is a marketing video marketing platform you can create videos you can uh, host videos you can repurpose so you can take videos you you've had say like this one or a live show yeah. or whatever repurpose it you can add it to emails you can do all kinds of different things with it um so it's a great it's a great tool for for any size business really um, a lot of social media managers digital marketers uh, who build me video landing pages with it etc use it um and uh, yeah i encourage everybody to check it out there's a free there's a free option as well and we'll put in the show notes a coupon code uh, specifically for for the listeners and your audience, John. Uh, so yeah. uh, if somebody is interested, they can get a discount. That'll be great. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it's simple. It's wave.video. Easy, Correct. just very, very colorful, very engaging site. So I would encourage you to go and check that out. All right. Well, listen, thanks, Daniel. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeline or CRM. I'll see you off another interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, for listening to us, and thanks, John. Thank you.